Hello, and welcome to General Astronomy, lecture number three, the Copernican Revolution. Before we begin, let's just take a look at this image. This is an image of many, many stars, several thousand stars at least. A very impressive in, uh, image of a dense region of stars. But what makes this even more impressive is where that picture came from. That entire image came from the point right here at the tip of the arrow. All of those stars, those many thousands of stars, all that is within this tiny speck right here. So just another image to give you some perspective on things that we are not quite alone in this vast universe, at least with our stars. I'm sure we'll find the life soon. Anyway, back to the Copernican Revolution. The Greeks and other ancient peoples developed many important scientific ideas, but what we now think of as science arose during uh, the European Renaissance. Within half a century after the fall of Constantinople in 1453, Polish scientist Nicholas Copernicus began the work that ultimately overturned the Earth-centered Ptolemaic model, also known as the geocentric model. Nicholas Copernicus was born in Toruń, Poland, on February 19th of 1473. His family was wealthy, and he received an education in mathematics, medicine, and law. He began studying astronomy, though, in his late teens. By that time, tables of planetary motion based on the Ptolemaic model had been noticeably inaccurate, but few people were willing to undertake the difficult calculations required to revise those tables. In his quest for a better, better way to predict planetary positions, Copernicus decided to try Aristocrus's sun-centered idea, first proposed more than 1,700 years earlier. He had read of Aristocrus's work and recognized that much that recognized the much simpler explanation for apparent retrograde motion, that backwards motion of planets in the sky, uh, was offered by a sun-centered system. But he went far beyond Aristocrus in working out mathematical details of the model. Through this process, Copernicus discovered simple geometric relationships that allowed him to calculate each planet's orbital period around the sun, as well as its relative distance from the sun in terms of the Earth-Sun distance, which we call the astronomical unit today. The model's success in providing a geometric layout for the solar system convinced him that the sun-centered model must be correct. Despite his own confidence in the model, Copernicus was hesitant to publish his work, fearing that his suggestion that the Earth moved would be considered absurd. However, he discussed his system with other scholars, including high-ranking officials of the Catholic Church, who urged him to publish a book. Copernicus saw the first printed copy of his book, um, which is translates to Concerning the Revolutions of the Heavenly Spheres, on the day that he died, May 24th, 1543. publication of the book spread the sun-centered idea widely, and many scholars were drawn to its aesthetic advantages. Nevertheless, the Copernican model gained relatively few converts over the next 50 years, and for good reason. It didn't work that well. The primary problem was that Copernicus had been, wi had been willing... I'm sorry. The primary problem was that while Copernicus had been willing to overturn Earth's central place in the cosmos, he still held fast to the idea of the that the ancient peoples had that the heavenly motions must occur in perfect circles. So he went past the idea of us being the center of everything, but we still were thinking of perfect circles. This is an incorrect assumption forced this incorrect assumption forced him to add numerous complexities to his system, and including those circles upon circles, much like those used by Ptolemy to get it to make decent predictions. In the end, his complete model was no more accurate and no less complex than the Ptolemaic model, and few people were willing to throw out thousands of years of tradition for a new model that worked just as poorly as the old one. So he was right in making the sun the center of our solar system, but still um, using perfect circles, which we know today is not the case. It added so many complexities that it really didn't make the model any better. So, um, imagine riding on a fast racehorse. As you pass a slowly walking pedestrian nearby, he appears to move backwards relative to you, even though he is still traveling in the same direction as you and your horse. 
This sort of simple observation inspired Aristocrist to formulate the heliocentric model in which all the planets, including Earth, revolved around the Sun. Different planets take different lengths of time to complete an orbit. So from time to time, one planet will overtake another, just as a fast-moving horse overtakes a person on foot. When Earth overtakes Mars, for example, Mars appears to move backward in the sky, and that's what we call retrograde motion. So this figure here tries to explain that. Um, planets move at different speeds. So here you'll see whatever it is, uh, this is Earth's orbit on the inside, Mars is on the outside. What happens is the Earth actually catches up to Mars, and then it starts to move faster and pass Mars up. So as we're passing Mars, it appears to us to move backwards in the sky. So you can see this tracing out, one, two, three, but then four, five, and six are moving backwards before continuing back to a west to east motion. So this perfectly explains retrograde motion now. We, not that whole circle on a circle thing where we have the epicycles and the deference, um, but we have this idea now that planets move at different speeds and overtake one another. And that is the reason that we have um, retrograde motion. So here's our first concept check. You'll see these once in a while throughout our lectures. What I'll do is ask you the question and then I'll pause for a couple seconds where you can pause the video and think about this. And then whenever you're ready, you can return and hear my answer. So, the first question we have. In the heliocentric model, could an imaginary observer on the surface of the sun look out and see planets moving in this retrograde motion? So in just a second, when I say to, pause your video and think about it, and then come back when you're ready. So pause your video now. All right, so the answer is no. A planet only appears to move in that backward retrograde motion if seen from another planet if the two planets were to move at different speeds and pass one another. An imaginary observer on the stationary sun would only see planets moving in the same direction as they orbit the sun. So you wouldn't get retrograde motion. So that should be the answer. There we go. Okay. Copernicus realized that because Mercury and Venus are always observed fairly near the Sun in the sky, their orbits must be smaller than the Earth's. Planets in such orbits are called inferior planets. And by the way, we're going to go through lots of definitions here, but you'll soon see a slide with an image showing all these things. So for now, um, you know, try to follow along with the definitions, but the image will be coming soon to help out. And you can sw uh, go back and forth between them if you need. So all those planets in the smaller orbits to us are called inferior planets. The other, the, other, the other visible planets, that being Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, are sometimes seen on the side of the celestial sphere opposite to the Sun. When this happens, Earth must lie between the Sun and these planets. Copernicus concluded that the orbits of Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn must be larger than Earth's orbit. So these planets are called superior planets. So we're going to go through a bunch of definitions now. Um, so let's see here. When Mercury or Venus is visible after sunset, it is near what we call greatest eastern elongation, where elongation is the angle between the sun and a planet as viewed from Earth. So greatest eastern elongation is when Mercury or Venus is visible after sunset, um, and its position is as far east of the sun as possible. So um, in this case, it would appear above the western horizon after sunset. Um, and we would all often call it an evening, st evening star as a result. Excuse me. Then we have greatest western elongation. It's the same idea. At greatest western elongation, Mercury or Venus is as far west of the sun as it could possibly be. It then rises before the sun, gracing the pre-dawn skies as a morning star in the east. When Mercury or Venus is at what we call inferior conjunction, it is between us and the Sun. So it's inferior planet, so it's a planet with an orbit lower or smaller than ours. So it's an inferior conjunction when it is between us and the Sun, and it moves from the evening sky into the morning sky over weeks to months. At superior conjunction, um, a planet is on the opposite side of the Sun. 
So it's moving back into the evening sky. So inferior conjunction is when a planet is between us and the sun, and then superior conjunction is when a planet is on the opposite side of the sun to us. A superior planet such as Mars, whose orbit is larger than the Earth's, is best seen in the night sky when it is at what we call opposition. At this point, it is a, in, I'm sorry, at this point in its orbit, the planet is in the part of the sky opposite the sun and is highest in the sky at midnight. This is also when the planet appears brightest because it is closest to us. And one more, I believe. But when a superior planet like Mars is located behind the sun at conjunction, it is above the horizon during the daytime and thus is not well placed for nighttime viewing. So these are all different uh, terms that we give to locations of planets in our sky. So here is the image I was talking about. It is dense and all of those definitions are in here. Um, but it's a very good reference and you will need to know these things. Um, I can guarantee you that. So the heliocentric model explains why planets appear in different parts of the sky on different dates. When and where in the sky a planet can be seen from Earth depends on the size of its orbit and its location on that orbit. The inferior planets uh, cycle between being visible in the west after sunset and in the east before sunrise. So here's that image showing you all these different locations. So conjunction um, happens whenever a planet is either if it's inferior between us and the sun or superior on the opposite side of the sun. You have the greatest eastern and western elongations, which is um, the farthest to the east or west that the planet will be relative to us and the sun. So you can see it makes out an angle here. It will never be at a greater angle than this, right? It's either moving over here where it'll be a smaller angle, or if you come down here, it's also a smaller angle. So that's the greatest elongation. Um, and then opposition is just when a planet is behind us relative to the sun. And this is when it rises, uh, or when it's viewed overhead at midnight, and it's the best time to view it, because it's closest to us, right? It's way closer here than it is anywhere else in the orbit. Uh, so that's a lot of terms to throw at you in the beginning here. So again, just, just review the slides with the terms and then compare them to this image, and you should have at least a basic idea of how this will work. So let's look at our next concept check. How many times is Mars at inferior conjunction during one orbit around the Sun? So go back, take a look at what inferior conjunction means, take a look at that image, and try to figure out how many times it would be at that configuration as it goes around the Sun once. So pause your video now and come back when you're ready. Alright, Mars has an orbit around the Sun that is larger than the Earth's orbit. So as a result, Mars never moves to a position between the Earth and the Sun. So Mars is never at inferior conjunction. All right. So uh, Copernicus found uh, correspondence between the time a planet takes to complete one orbit, that is its period, so we call period the time it takes to complete an orbit, and the size of the orbit. So now we're starting to finally put some math into this and get some numbers out. So there is a relationship between the size of the orbit and the time it takes to complete said orbit. Um, so determining this period um, of a planet that it takes to... Sorry, there's a lot of stuff going on outside. Determining the period of a planet takes some care because Earth, from which we must make the observations, is also moving. Realizing this, Copernicus was careful to distinguish between two different periods of each planet. The synodic period is the time that elapses between two successive identical configurations as seen from Earth. For example, from one opposition to the next or from one con uh, conjunction to the next. So, synodic period is just the time between two equal uh, configurations. However, the sidereal period is the true orbital period of a planet, so the actual time that it takes for a uh, planet to orbit the Sun. So that is our sidereal period. Um, so this table here just shows you the different uh, periods for each planet, from Mercury to Neptune, and uh, there's some interesting trends that we'll start to get into. First, you'll notice the true time, sidereal period, on the right increases more and more as you go further out. So there's that relationship between size of an orbit and how long it takes. 
The synodic period is a bit different, so we'll look into that in a bit. So here is another concept check. Why is it that Jupiter's sidereal period is longer than its synodic period? So this is a tough one, so think about this for a moment. Um, but I'll give you the answer in just a moment. So pause your video and reference those slides. So the question says, why is Jupiter's sidereal period longer than its synodic period? So let's go back. So here we see um, synodic period is much lower than its sidereal period, right? So why is that? Well, Jupiter moves slowly and does not move very far in the time it takes for Earth to pass Jupiter by, moving around the Sun and pass it again, giving Jupiter a synodic period similar to the Earth's orbital period of one year. However, slow-moving Jupiter takes more than a decade to move around the Sun back to its original position, giving it a very large sidereal period. So it takes a decade to go all the way around the Sun. But, relative to us, because we move around the sun so fast, we come back to that position where we were pretty quickly. So it has a really low synodic period. So this stuff is a little bit tough to grasp. Um, I can't spend an entire lecture talking about it, but, um, you know, review this stuff, practice it a little bit. I believe your book covers it even more. Um, so, review it if you need. To find a relationship between the sidereal period of a planet and the size of its orbit, Copernicus still had to determine the relative distances of the planets from the Sun. So we needed a distance measure. Well, he devised a straightforward geometric method of determining the relative distances of the planets from the Sun using trigonometry. His answers turned out to be remarkably close to modern values. The distances are given in terms of astronomical units here on this table, which is the average distance from Earth to the Sun. However, Copernicus did not know the precise value of this distance, so he could only determine the relative sizes of the orbits of the planets. So here you can see how remarkably close Copernicus was way back in the day. Um, I mean, he's off by one one hundredth of an astronomical unit, and of course as you get further away it's a little bit harder to measure, but still, I mean, within great accuracy, um, all things considered. And note, we weren't able to see Uranus and Neptune back then, so um, he, there's no values for that yet. But remarkable accuracy for just using a bit of trigonometry to um, figure out the sizes of these orbits. Um, it's insane. Okay. By comparing these two tables that I've shown you, you can see the unifying relationship between planetary orbits in the Copernican model. The farther out a planet is from the Sun, the longer it takes to travel around it in its orbit. That is, the longer its sidereal period, right? So I showed you that before. So um, you can see here that the further out a planet is, right? They're, you're moving from Mercury to Neptune. You're moving further away from the sun. Well, it takes longer and longer to go around the sun. That seems pretty obvious to us today, um, but this is the first time it was ever noticed. Um, so this is for two reasons. One, the large, larger the orbit, the farther a planet must travel to complete its orbit right? It makes sense. You have a greater distance to cover, so it's going to take more time. Um, but also, uh, the larger the orbit, the slower a planet moves. So not only is it more distance to cover, but it's also moving more slowly. Uh, so for example, Mercury, with its small orbit, moves at an average speed of 47.9 kilometers a second, or 107,000 miles per hour. But Saturn, which is much further away, travels around its large orbit much more slowly at an average speed of 9.64 kilometers per second, or 21.6 thousand miles per hour. The older Ptolemaic model offers no such simple relationships between the motions of different planets. So this is the first time now that we're having some accuracy um, between the motions of planets as well. So um, what we'll do now is just continue a little bit further with um, some of the important people um, that led to these discoveries as well. And we're taking it one step further through this Copernican revolution. Next up is Tycho. Part of the difficulty faded, uh, faced by astronomers who sought to improve either the Ptolemaic or the Copernican system was a lack of quality data. Better data were provided by the Danish nobleman Tycho Brahe. Tycho became interested in astronomy as a young boy, but his family discouraged this interest. He therefore kept his passion secret, learning the constellations from a miniature model of a celestial sphere that he kept hidden in his home. 
As he grew older, Tycho was often arrogant about both his noble birth and his intellectual abilities. At age 20, he fought a duel with another student over which of them was the better mathematician. Part of Tycho's nose was cut off, and he designed a replacement piece made of silver and gold. In 1563, Tycho decided to observe a widely anticipated alignment of Jupiter and Saturn. To his surprise, the alignment occurred nearly two days later than the date Copernicus had predicted. Resolving to improve the state of astronomical predictions, he set about compiling careful observations of stellar and planetary positions in the sky. Tycho's fame grew after he observed what he called a nova, meaning new star, in 1572. By measuring its parallax, and comparing it to the parallax of the moon, he proved that the nova was much farther away than the moon. Today we know that he saw a supernova, the explosion of a distant star. So parallax is um, a phenomenon in which the apparent position of an object changes because of the motion of the observer. So this is something you can actually test out yourself. Um, so here's an example of this. If we're on one side of the Earth, um, here on the left, and we look at a nearby object, well, if you look at that object compared to the background, it looks like it's somewhere over here in the sky. But 12 hours later, when we're on the other side of the Earth, and we look at that same nearby object, well, now it's going to look like it's to the left in the background stars. So this apparent motion of an object, just because of us moving, is known as parallax. So it hasn't actually moved necessarily, we just have, and we see it in a different location. And you can actually um, test this out just by holding your hand in front of your face. Um, just hold a finger right in front of your face very close, and look at it with one eye closed, and then switch your eyes, so close the other one, and go back and forth quickly. You look crazy doing it, but your finger moves back and forth um, relative to the background objects in your room. Um, so that is an effect of parallax, and that's exactly what we're talking about here. So, uh, King Frederick II of Denmark decided to sponsor Tycho's ongoing work, providing him with money to build an unparalleled ob observatory for naked eye observations. Over a period of three decades, Tycho and his assistants compiled naked eye observations accurate to within w less than one arc minute. So, that's less than the thickness of a fingernail viewed at arm's length. So if you hold the arm all the way out and look at the thickness of your nail, that's how accurate his observations were, just from naked eye observations, no telescopes or anything. Because the telescope was invented shortly after his death, Tycho's da data remains the best set of naked eye observations ever made. Despite the quality of his observations, however, Tycho never succeeded in coming up with a satisfying explanation for these planetary motions. All right, so that's a good cutoff point. Uh, from here, I think we'll continue our discussion in our next lecture. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you there.